So we'll get started with the uh, module one of uh, this workshop. We're at, in New York. So the, uh, the usual uh, Creative Commons slide, like Michelle mentioned, and uh, just to stress the point that it's a, um, it's a buy and share alike license. That means that if you, uh, there are different versions of the Creative Commons license. The one we're using is that you have to cite, if you're gonna use the material, you can, you can, re you can modify it, so which, which means you can take, let's say, a slide out of a PowerPoint and put it into your own lecture. That's fine, but you have to give credit to where you got it from, and this is a, sort of the little uh, uh, bad thing for some people, but I think it's a really uh, useful thing, is that means if you use one of our slides, you have to share your slides. <laughs> and so that is sort of an infectious agent. So if you get one of our slides into your talk, then your whole talk becomes free to the world. And so it's really uh, so it's uh, buy and share alike. So you have to share also. And so I encourage blogging, tweeting, video, taking notes and everything. So this is, uh, I'm the only one that uses this slide, I think. But uh, definitely, uh, I'm a big, big proponent of, of making the material available. This work I'm here this week I'm, is on behalf of my institution. My institution is paying me to be here this week. It's not, I'm not getting paid by the workshop per se. I'm uh, being more paid for by the OICR to, to deliver. So this is part of my job to, to, to give, give you these lectures. Right away, I'm going to put in the slide to say that the slide deck you have in your book is different than the slide deck I'm going to present to you. <laughs> and so that uh, we had to submit our slides a week ago. A lot has happened in the last week. And you, we're always thinking about our lectures and we're always updating our slides and whatnot. So the slides, today's lecture, this morning's lecture is actually not that many changes, so it's not a big deal. But my, my lecture tomorrow is going to have a few more slides that I've thought about in, uh, in the last week and that I need to, to add in uh, before, after I, I sent in my slides. So all the slides that have this little white dot in the bottom left here are slides which are not in your deck. So don't look for these pages. If you see a white dot, that means you don't have it. But it is on the wiki, as this PowerPoint is on the wiki. And so actually I was having some problems on the wiki this morning. So the PDF version is there, not the PowerPoint, but I'll fix that later today. So you'll have both the PDF and the PowerPoint available from the wiki later today which will have this slide. This is a different slide, so that's my email, it's my Twitter account, and the hashtag I was gonna use for this workshop turns out not so good. This is gonna to have to be one uh, that uh, we use if you wanna use the hashtags, if you know about hashtags. If you don't know about hashtags, you can ask me later. So we're gonna mention a few companies, and we have already, like Amazon and things like that, and so I just wanna declare that I'm not profiting, I don't have any uh, you know, stock options in Amazon or, or Oxford Nanopore or Illumina or any of these companies. And so I will not profit in any way, shape or form from mentioning any of these uh, companies. So what we're going to do in this first workshop is, like Michelle said, it's a very easy to start. You warm up. I don't mind laptops being open for this one. You can focus. You can uh, take notes on your laptop and so forth. Um, but it's going to be an oversight of, of these workshops and uh, also I'm going to introduce you to uh, some of the uh, cloud computing and work that we're going to be doing uh, this week. So I'll give you some intro about bioinformatics, history of the bioinformatics.ca, cloud computing and getting on the Amazon web server. So what do biologists do? They like to make observations, they like to and make hypotheses, test them, challenge them, conclude things, and then write papers. And so this is really what, what lab biologists like to do, but it's also what bioinformaticians like to do. We basically do the same things. We, we do the, what you do on a laptop is really a bioinformatics experiment. So you're testing out a hypothesis, you're uh, looking for something, you're, you're making discoveries, and you're making, interpreting data, and so forth. So it's although uh, bioinformaticians don't necessarily think of themselves as experimentalists, we actually are uh, very much so. And my background is, is, a bio, is in biology, and, but I have colleagues, of course, and you'll see, you'll see from the various instructors you're going to have this week, 
have backgrounds in computer science, math, physics, and so forth. But really, uh, we're all uh, doing testing uh, things and, and, and looking at uh, various things. So this week, we'll be looking at RNA-seq. We're not going to be doing any protein mass spec work, but it's part of the field of, of computational biology. Later in the week, we'll be doing uh, interactions and pathway analysis. This is a diagram, very clear uh, diagram of um, the, this was a work done several years ago in integrating all the interactions from the yeast cell. So this is all the known interactions put into one uh, big network diagram. And the colors of the dots represent, the dots are all the, no, the, the nodes are genes and the edges are interactions between these genes. And the different colors represent the, of the dots represent the different uh, Go uh, gene ontology uh, references uh, space. And so you can see things that are related to each other by, by their color. So the central dogma, which all of you know, I'm assuming, is, is DNA makes RNA makes protein. Uh, and then we have the sort of what I call the, uh, the NCBI version of the central dogma. Then DNA makes RNA makes protein, and then you write a paper about it. And so linking, of, of course, linking DNA, RNA, proteins, and publications is sort of a key thing to, to computational biology and a key thing to the, the way we, we do work uh, here. So some of the things uh, when we try to understand the cells is we do experiments. Some of these are bioinformatics experiments, like I mentioned. Uh, we want these to be reproducible. We want the people to find out our data. We want people to find out our methods. And we want them to be uh, able to rerun these experiments, validate them, and, 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 and move the science forward. So the classic experiment, bioinformatics experiment would be uh, 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 to do a blast search. And how many of you have done a blast search before? I hope most of you, many of you, yes, good. So we're, we're not going to do blast this week. That's somebody else's lecture, but it's good to. So, but think of the sequence as the reagent, right? The, 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 uh, the, the sequence that came from the database you're using. Think of the blast search itself as a method. And so which one are you doing? Are you doing a protein-protein blast? Are you doing a nucleotide protein or protein nucleotide? And think as the uh, alignment, as the interpretation, or looking at similarities and hypothesis testing. And so you have to know your reagents, you have to know your methods, and you have to uh, do your controls. And so you have to think about, so what would be an, an example of uh, a control in a blast experiment? Anybody? Yes, that's one example. Or also, a sequence you know is in the, in the database if you're able to find it. If you can't find it and you know it's in a database by looking for the same, using the same sequences, obviously you're using the wrong parameters that are, they aren't able to find each other. So you have to have both negative and positive controls in, in doing your experiments. And when you do bioinformatics experiments, you think about it that way as well. Sort of things that you're expecting to see, you do see. And things you don't want to see, you don't see. So, uh, so what is, uh, so what is bioinformatics? I mean, we're all doing. We all came to learn some bioinformatics this week, and so I'm going to give you my definition. And the my definition is covered on your slide, so you can't see it right now. But I'll show it to you in a second. And if you download the PowerPoint, you can see it. But right now, I'm going to ask you to team up with the person next to you. Uh, so two by two, sort of discuss and write down one sort of definition of bioinformatics. You start now. <laughs> and then I'll be asking you. So write, write down something and then I'll be asking you uh, just in a few, in a minute or so. Okay, so does uh, don't want to spend too much time on this. Does anybody have an answer? They want to share with the class. Are all the points? Yeah. Go ahead.
Here's my definition, basically a summary of everybody else's definitions. Is uh, bioinformatics is about integrating biological themes together with the help of computer tools and biological database and gaining new knowledge about the system and study. So it's really all of the answers. And of course, if you put 10 bioinformaticians in a room, you'll get 10 different answers, which is quite quite appropriate. But it's just it's it's important to, to think. I think about computational biology or bioinformatics, and there's lots of debates. Is it bioinformatics? Is it computational biology? Is, is it biocomputing and so forth? I do not. Uh, we actually were involved in writing a bioinformatics uh, book uh, 20, 20, was it 20 years already? Yeah, it's almost 20 years ago now, 15, 17 years ago. And we wanted to call it computational biology. And the publisher back then told us, over our dead body, you're calling it bioinformatics. It, bioinformatics is a much trendier word then than it is now. And I said, OK, we'll call it bioinformatics. And so we did. But it's really, there's a lot of people that say, oh, it's computational biology, it's not bioinformatics. As far as I'm concerned, it's both of those cover this space. People that like to do sort of more algorithm development and so forth like to think of themselves more as computational biology. People that sort of practice. Uh, computational biology, think of themselves more as bioinformatics. I, it's really sort of semantically sort of not really useful to separate those two. I think all of those people will come to this field and, and, and contribute to this field. And you can be a practitioner, a developer, uh, developing databases, developing ontologies, and, and so forth. And you're part of the community. Uh, it's a very inclusive community. So I think it's not really useful to, to separate it with those terms. So the uh, the Canadian Bioinformatics Workshop Series uh, was started in 1998. And so when I was at, uh, I used to be at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver at the Center for Molecular Medicine and Therapeutics, and also part of the Canadian Genetic Disease Network, which is basically a network of ge which doesn't exist anymore of geneticists from across Canada. There's about 50 groups across Canada as part. And one of the things that they realized they were needing back in, in 97, actually, when we started planning this workshop or this idea, is um, that we needed uh, training in, in computational biology slash bioinformatics slash uh, whatever your favorite name is for it. And so we uh, started back then through the, so through the CGDN, the Canadian Genetic Disease Network, we started the Canadian Bioinformatics Workshop Series. And actually, one of the... TAs in that first year of the workshop um, sort of realized that bioinformatics.ca domain name wasn't taken yet. And he says, oh, you should, take, you should register that right away. So, oh my God, that's a good idea. And so uh, thanks to uh, that uh, TA, who's now a faculty, uh, we, we, uh, we got that domain name. And in uh, 1999, we actually had our first workshop in Calgary. And back then, the workshops were, um, there was four different workshops we, we taught. And the bioinformatics workshop was a, uh, a two-week workshop. So you think you have it long this week. Imagine being here for two weeks. And so it was two weeks, and we covered all the basics of, I referred to BLAST and Entree and structured databases and nucleotide, various nucleotide databases, GenBank and so forth. And we covered... Uh, um, some basic genomics, we did some uh, ACE-DB back then, we did a, a bunch of, of things. And then that was sort of a two-week workshop, and that two-week workshop was a prerequisite for the one-week workshop of the other type. So the other one-week workshop we had, we had one on proteomics, one on genomics, and one on tool development. The tool development workshop was, uh, was the least popular of our workshop, and we've only offered it like three or four times over the years. It also turned into a one time into one year into uh, basically um, NCBI toolkit development workshop. Uh, it was, uh, and it turned out not to be um, sort of the big one. But even the sort of the bioinformatics, proteomics, and genomics, even those around 2006, 2007, we were getting fewer and fewer people uh, 
um, coming to these workshops. And so we thought, are we, are we becoming bad teachers? What's happening? And there's, there's several issues. One is that these longer workshop, as you probably know, t taking a, going away for a week is difficult. And so being away from your, uh, your lab and, and so forth for a whole week is, is a bit challenging. And so and going away for two weeks is even more difficult. But the other very big change that happened in, in those seven years, eight years, is that universities started offering these introductory, so they're really sort of intro, intro, introductory type workshops. And so they were now being offered throughout, throughout the world, basically. So, uh, and, and so the, our introductory workshops of one and two weeks didn't quite fit the model anymore. And although they are still offered, uh, sort of similar, sort of two-week workshops are offered at Cold Spring Harbor. They're offered at the EBI in Europe. Uh, they're offered at several places, and so uh, it didn't quite work out as much for for the Canadian Bioinformatics workshop as well. So what we started in 2008, which actually was coincidental with uh, Michelle and I's move to from Vancouver to uh, Toronto, is we uh, started a new series of workshops, which were short and more sort of leading edge type technology, new, the new things that are happening in the field. And having it sort of two and three day workshop allowed us to have them, for us to be more flexible and to be more to the point of what was needed to be delivered. And so we started those in 2008. And now we have, as Michelle mentioned, a number of workshops that we're offering um, in, uh, across the year, every, mostly in the summertime. But now we're not quite the summer yet, and we're started already. And so we have, in sort of alphabetical order, we have a, a metagenomics workshop, and that's a three-day workshop. Uh, cancer genomics, which is a five-day, one of our longer ones. Uh, uh, analysis uh, exploration in, in R workshop, two days, and so forth. Are we okay? Yeah. So we're just powering people up that need some power. Um, so we have a, a high throughput uh, biology from Sequence and Network, which is this one this week, which is our first time offering uh, information and stats in metagenomics, uh, sorry, metabolomics, two days, um, another RNA-seq uh, workshop, two days, and informatics, a high throughput sequence uh, data, uh, it's a two-day workshop. And so when you think about it, giving a two-day workshop on, high, you know, on, on next-gen sequencing uh, bioinformatics is a little surreal. I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of s material to cover, but we definitely, we sort of teach, as an example of that one, is we teach um, where to find things and how to do things, and, and hopefully give you the, the, the starting uh, ideas and vocabulary and insights on what you need to do. So, uh, oh, this is a modified version of my talk, oh yes. And so, um, so this week's workshop is actually a mixture of, of three of our existing workshops. So it's the um, high throughput biology uh, uh, workshop of, uh, so it's this workshop here, this high throughput sequencing. It's the RNA C workshop, so it's two plus two is four, and it's the network pathway workshop, which is down here is three, so that gives you your seven days. So you're getting seven days worth into one week, uh, sort of crammed uh, into, uh, uh, to, to uh, which we haven't done, and um, like I said before, we try to schedule sometimes to have workshops back to back, so people will register for them separately, but uh, we haven't, this is the first one we've given as a, as a package. As Michelle said, you know, all information is about uh, the workshops are on bioinformatics.ca and invite you to visit that website. And all our previous material from previous years is available online. And as we mentioned, it's available as either and or PowerPoint, PDFs, and also uh, movies. And so we have um, movie files that are available in uh, from a voice over a PowerPoint, and that works most of the time. And uh, so this is the course info uh, or URL, the workshop announcement mailing list, if you want to be on the mailing list for that. It's a separate list than the one Michelle mentioned, and I invite you to, to subscribe to this one as well. So, um, 
this is uh, standing on a soapbox time a little bit. So open access, open data, open source are essential, I think, are essential for science. They're essential for computational biology, and they're essential for, for us to deliver this workshop. And so it's, it's not only a responsibility and an obligation, but it's, I think it's something that um, comes with privileges of doing uh, publicly funded work. And so I strongly encourage you to uh, think about and think in, in this space and, and think about how, you, who, who, how yourself you can contribute to this information space. Um, if, you take, if you think of BLAST, which we talked about earlier, it is a uh, software package, which is it's a, it's, a, it's, a, actually, it's more than open source. It's actually part of the public domain, so it's actually free for you. So it's, it's BLAST was developed by the NCBI. It's actually so open that you can actually download it. You don't have to do anything. You can sell it if you want. You can find somebody who will buy it. You're allowed to, <laughs> to sell it. And so companies have done that, of course. They've repackaged BLAST into their own package and, and sell their whole package, which includes BLAST. And so that's totally available. It's, it's the, the work of the U.S. government, and, and it's, uh, it's, made, uh, it, it's made that possible. But BLAST would not exist or would not be necessary if it wasn't for GenBank. And GenBank is the DNA sequence database of all publicly available sequences. And if we didn't have GenBank, then we wouldn't need BLAST. So BLAST, GenBank, which is an open source, sorry, an open access database, made it necessary to have a tool like BLAST and allowed BLAST to be developed and perfected and improved and so forth. And so all of these things are connected to each other and really um, uh, are, are critical for the work we do. That said, I don't want to be against commercial tools per se. And so there is a niche for commercial uh, activities and, and computational biology, of course. And uh, in my mind, if they take, they can develop their own software and if they want to sell it and people want to buy it, that's great. But I think where they serve an even more important niche is in the sort of uh, support and, and, and service uh, sector. And so people that buy uh, uh, certain software packages, what you get is you get a help desk, you get a, somebody will help you with using that software in their package and so forth. And so I think that's great for companies to do that. But academics work in sort of the, uh, sort of the free space in a sense, but in a sense, it's, but nothing's free, right? My salary is paid for by somebody, my time and everybody else's time here is paid for by somebody. And so none of this and the internet is not free because somebody paid for that as well. So all of these things are free in the sense that they don't cost you anything to do, but there's always, there's a number of organizations and, and, and groups paying for it in the background to make things better, to improve health, to improve crops, productivity, to improve uh, connectivity between people, to improve science and so forth. So all of these things are critical to, to what we do. But at the same time, what happens is that uh, I wrote a letter to Nature a few years back that it was critical that if you find something wrong in a database, if you find an error, and I, I swear to you, there are some errors there. It's, I know it's hard to believe there are errors in the databases, the public databases, but there are some. And if you come across one of these and you'll see that a sequence doesn't make sense, it's contaminated with, with vector or, or whatever, there's something wrong with it. It's really your responsibility as a user of these resources to let the, the resource themselves know that the changes need, there's a, there's an error, there appears to be an error here, maybe you guys want to have a look at it. And I, I did that one, one, several years ago, I found I was, was doing a search for a mitochondrial sequence and using BLAST and so forth, and I came across a record which obviously was contaminated with vector sequence. And, and so I informed the database and question that had that, that sequence and they fixed it and they, a few weeks later the, the sequence shrunk by half and so uh, and then you could do and then so my search was not confusing anymore so I redid my search and now it made sense the results I get and I didn't hit the sequence anymore and so it was really uh, useful um, to, to move to move things forward so 
Um, so uh, this letter was about GenBank, but this could be you know any database uh, that you that you uh, work with, uh, or any software. If there's a software package that's not that's misbehaving, I'm sure the people that are using that software would love to hear back from you, and to to, to hear back. And so it's really uh, becomes a again a responsibility of of the community to uh, be able to use that. Michelle, are you pointing at me at something? No. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, we're, we'll get there. So, so why do we have bioinformatics? It's because they open data from genomics and proteomic technologies. And so, the reason you know we, we're here this week is because there's lots of data coming in. A lot of it is publicly available. Obviously, not all of it is, but at the same time, uh, many of the tools we're going to use this week are publicly uh, available. They're open source software packages, mostly, if not entirely. And, uh, and that's really sort of uh, a key to, to what we're doing this week. So Michelle is just wanting me to jump along to get to this slide. So we're on this slide. And what we're going to talk about now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm just going to talk about cloud computing and why we're using cloud computing uh, this week. So, so far, before I start this section, any questions, comments, concerns, why not? Are things OK? And feel free to raise your hand throughout uh, whenever I talk. I tend to ramble sometimes. Interrupt me. That's good. I don't mind. And uh, let me know. OK? So we're OK so far? We haven't done anything hard yet, so that's good that you're OK. <laughs> so, so cloud computing and the new sort of uh, software paradigm. So I think. So one of the big things that's happening in, in our world now in, in computational biology and biology in general is that, oops, what happened here? Just to make sure that I'm still running Camtasia. Uh, okay, that's still running, that's good. Okay, so um, is that the, the data space we're working with is sort of reaching sort of petabyte scale and soon probably exabyte scale. Um, so as an example, so one of the projects I'm involved with is the International Cancer Genome Consortium. And we are sequencing the worldwide, so it's not just us at, at OICR, but we're part of a group worldwide sequencing uh, on the scale of about um, 25,000 human genomes from tumor samples paired with their normal DNA. So that's actually 50,000 genomes and transcriptomes and epigenomes and clinical data. And at the end, of, so we're about sort of three quarters of the project, but at the end of the project, we think that the whole data set will be about 10 petabytes and compressed will be about three petabytes. So this is really sort of, we're talking starting to large scale. So this will not be a data set that you can download to your laptop. Don't, don't think about it. <laughs> but it will be a data set that will be available somewhere, and you'll be able to go there and do your work on that data set. So that's the way, that's the way we we're thinking about this space right now. So there are more and more large data sets that downloading to your computer is not really possible, but moving your computes to where that data exists is possible. And this is where cloud computing, the rationale behind cloud computing comes from. And uh, the other thing about, uh, as you probably know about human data, is that uh, often you need uh, special permission to look at this data. Because human data is often, not always, but most, most of the time, is covered or protected by um, a, a body uh, and there are several bodies across the world, so uh, that sort of makes sure that if you're a scientist looking at this data, you're going to do good things with this data, and you're not going to try, for example, to re-identify the person that, whose DNA sequences you may be looking at, and you're not going to try to to exploit the fact that you know who it is and the fact that they have this this mutation or this disease, and so that. So you're not going to do that kind of things. And so that's why you need to have special permission. And the special permission you're asking is actually making sure it's also signed by somebody who can fire you should you 
digress from what it is you said you were going to do. And so your institution usually backs you up on, on, on your application for this kind of data. And so the other thing about uh, sort of things that are changing in the software development world is that uh, it's, going to, it's becoming less and less, although most of the things we're going to be doing this week are still in that space, but it's less about reading a file into memory, doing some computes, and then writing the output file, but more and more into sort of working on streaming data. And so the Oxford Nanopore, for example, is, is sort of using that thinking about the data the data's streaming through the machine as it comes through, some analysis is done on it, and then some files are, are, are made up, and, and then at the end, when the thing is finished streaming, then you write a file output. And so all of these things are sort of changing the paradigms in which we're, we're thinking. Um, my uh, colleague and, and, and uh, the person I report to, Lincoln Stein, uh, wrote a piece in, uh, in uh, Genome Biology a few years back looking about the sort of the growth of, of the data. And so he looked at sort of the, um, the next-gen sequence uh, growth curve, and so how much it was costing to generate data, and so the hard disk storage, and so the, how much that was going to cost, and how the, with the new next-gen sequencing, uh, how that, that curve is changing so that basically what was going to happen is going to become more expensive to store a nucleotide than to sequence a nucleotide. Okay, so think about that. And so it's going to become it's easier to generate the data every time you need it than to actually store it on a uh, computer and then going to that computer to, to get that nucleotide. We're not there yet, although one could argue we're going to be there in a few years. What this equation doesn't take to, into account is the, the bandwidth, the machine bandwidth, basically, that is not there. We don't have enough machines to resequence everything all the time than to actually go sequence only when we need it. But in the end, the best and most secure and probably most compact way of storing a DNA sequence is probably in a minus 80 freezer in a vial. And so that if you need that sequence again, that's, that should be your backup. It should be that DNA sequence in, in the freezer. And so sometimes it's possible to do that. Sometimes you're sequencing samples from a cell line, for example, and so you have lots of DNA. But sometimes you're dealing with tumor samples or environmental, rare environmental samples and whatnot, and so you don't have access to DNA all the time. So you do have to store the DNA sequences and you have to, make, you have to keep it around and so forth. But it's something uh, to think about. So we have now, we're almost at the $1,000 genome, so which has been talked about for so many years. And so it's, depending who, which company you speak to, it's 1000 or it's 2000 And depending on which currency, Canadian dollars, US dollars, and so forth, it varies a little bit. <laughs> and, um, and, but what the, the joke is, is it's a $1,000 genome, but it costs a million to analyze it, right? And so it's, so even though it's a cheap to sequence, it's, it's continues to be very difficult to analyze. And one of the reasons why we have to keep all these FASTQ files around right now is that because we actually don't trust any of our software in generating the right answer. And so we want to keep the FASTQ, the raw data around so that new software comes around and can reanalyze and remap and realign the whole, the whole thing. Because nobody's got it right yet. And that's why there's many, if you read bioinformatics and computational biology journals, you'll find many, many new tools to align and to map and so forth, be it for DNA or RNA and so forth. Like there's a hundred plus RNA seq aligners. And so why they haven't figured it out yet is because it's, there's too many, the technology, the reads are too short maybe, or, or they're, and that's why the long reads are, 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 are bringing new insights and new, uh, and we'll talk about that a bit more this week. Uh, and so there, there's new, the technology is changing all the time. And so the, the, the software obviously has to try to keep up. And uh, so, so what's, what are we to do? So too much data is not enough, not enough computer infrastructure for most labs. So where do we go? What, you know, write more grants, write more, get, buy more hardware or we look to the sky. 
And obviously, many genomic companies have done this already. So they basically, you send them your DNA, they sequence it, they put the ship, or most the, the fastest way sometimes to get data from one place to another place is by truck. And so, uh, so you ship your DNA on hard drives to Amazon. And like I've spoke to Amazon people many times, and they say, oh yeah, we're really good at shipping stuff. I said, oh yeah, you are. <laughs> so Amazon, if you want to ship a drive to Amazon, they're, they're more than happy to deal with it and, and, and then load that drive, that data from that drive onto the cloud and then make that data available for you and your colleagues and whoever you want to give it access to that way. And so that's a really sort of a simple way of, 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 of reason for using the cloud. And of course, many companies are, are there already. So uh, Google, uh, Dropbox, Twitter, Netflix, and so forth, they're all using the cloud right now. And so Amazon Web Services are, uh, have a, uh, a large, they have football fields amongst football fields worth of these containers that they just bring in, plug in, and then all of a sudden they have uh, hundreds of more racks of, of storage and, and computes available to them at uh, multiple uh, untold uh, places across the world. Uh, one of the challenges we have with, with we have currently with Amazon with respect to uh, uh, data, acts, data permissions and, and dealing with human data and so forth, which is now allowed, but it wasn't allowed for many years, is that Amazon won't tell you where they are. So they're somewhere on the planet, that's, you know, but it could be in a barge in Thailand or it can be in northern Canada, although I don't think they're in Canada. Maybe they are, but they haven't told me. And, or, or it's in Virginia, the Ireland, and so forth. So you know sort of geographically which space that they are at, but you don't know exactly where they are. Google's the same. Uh, is, is much more uh, sort of hidden, actually, than Amazon. Amazon, you actually know the zone. But of course, people have flown over all these places and they see these large uh, you know, spaces and, and so forth. So that's uh, they're sort of easy to, to find. So some of the challenges with cloud computing, it's not always cheap. Uh, so you can do expensive mistakes. Uh, I remember the, fir the first workshop we did, we actually left the workshop going and we spent several thousands of dollars of non-used machines or maybe some students after the workshop were still using them, I don't know. But anyway, we they, they gave us our money back, so that was very nice. Um, getting files in and out sometimes is difficult, so we have to leave, you have to deal with uh, the slowest point of connectivity of, of bandwidth connection is between, it's not necessarily at Amazon, it could be your institute has a bad bandwidth connection to, to the rest of the world, and so that becomes a, the rate limiting step. Um, it's not the best solution all the time, and actually this week we'll be using Amazon for some of the labs, but not all of the labs. And so you'll see uh, some experiments which are, are done better, and, um, uh, and I've talked about sort of personal health information and security concerns. So some people say, well, if I have personal health information on Amazon, is everybody going to have access to it and so forth? Actually, it turns out that Amazon is one of the most secure uh, compute infrastructure. It's more secure than most of your university's infrastructure. Maybe not the DOD, but <laughs> but uh, it, it is very secure. And you can actually have double encryption, and you can have uh, uh, FOBs and, and, and all sorts of security uh, protocols available to, to, to do work on Amazon. So it's really it's actually used by the, the U.S. government for uh, for lots of, of, of very sensitive uh, data and and so you are now maybe not a DOD but you are now so NIH has just given approval to use commercial clouds for human genome data so it's now as of two three weeks ago so you're now allowed to use human genomic data for um, DB gap restricted data sets uh, you're allowed to do that on Amazon. You have to get special permission from from the DB Gap, but it's part of it's going to become there. They've just opened the gates uh, just a few weeks ago, and so sorry. Yeah, well, it took. I would say it probably took three years from NIH to <laughs> to do to to get there, and so it, it was a long process. 
So I know, DOD will be three years from now, yes. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I totally uh, appreciate and, and understand uh, the challenges there. So, um, so obviously, there's some of the advantages of, of uh, cloud computing is that one is actually for this workshop, we wrote a grant to Amazon. So actually, the Amazon dollars we're going to be spending this week are free dollars in the sense that didn't cost me anything, didn't cost Michelle anything. So we got Amazon to give us free dollars. But it's a little bit, it's a bad joke, but it's, it's a bit like giving crack to kids. So they enjoy it, they have a great time this week, and now they go home and they want to have their own, then they have to pay for it. <laughs> so, so this week it's free, but once you go home and start doing the same thing on Amazon, you'll have to pay for it. And uh, so you have to keep that in mind. But it's really useful for our teaching because we're able to reproduce, we are reproduce to have really sort of high um, quality uh, compute infrastructure with the high bandwidth and sorry, the high sort of compute powers that we need and have the same available to every student in the class. So that would be very hard to have even in this building to, to sort of the first years Actually, in 2007, when we started doing the next-gen workshops at, at OICR in Toronto, we actually got the, the systems group to sort of carve out part of the rack for the workshop. But even that was not enough to do to handle the, the, the load from this class. And so it's really from that point of view to have a spike. It's sort of classic C, uh, Amazon usage. Is basically, you needed a lot of it for a short amount of time then going to the Amazon is really the, the, the sort of the best uh, use uh, example uh, for doing that. Um, there are, um, it's, it's getting easier to transfer large, large uh, data sets to Amazon. And actually what's happening with Amazon is actually they're loading a lot of public data sets and making them available uh, worldwide. So the data is already there that you want to compute on. So that's really it makes it useful. Um, like the thousand genome data, for example. Um, there's uh, AMI, so Amazon machine images are available that have a lot of, which is basically the, the, the virtual machine that we're working on, they already have all the tools that we need uh, for, for this workshop. And so uh, there are lots of, so we're gonna have one that we're gonna use this week, but there are others that are available that are made available throughout multiple organization Galaxy, for example, which we're going to use as well, is, av is available, has, there's an AMI, or, or there's quite a few AMIs that have Galaxy installed in them. But I'll, I'll talk about that more tomorrow. Um, and then uh, you should also keep in mind that we're working with Amazon this week, but there are other uh, solutions. There's uh, Google has uh, genomic space. Their institutions have basically what they would refer to as cloud infrastructure as well. And so there's lots of solutions. This academic, what we call academic clouds also are, are available. So you should look for this. So this week, some of the tools and data you're going to be working with are going to be on your computer. Some of it is going to be on the web somewhere. And other things will be in the cloud. And really sort of traversing in these three spaces is going to be some of the things you learn this week and see, make advantage of what's easier done one place or another. And you're going to become efficient at, at sort of moving things around. And um, there are different ways of, of using the cloud. There's most of the things that we're going to do is going to be command lined. And so you'll be typing in the commands at the prompt and things, some computes are going to happen. And then uh, you'll have files and then you can view these files in a number of ways, some of which may be with uh, viewers that you have on your laptop. Uh, yourself or in a browser or something like that. So, um, uh, yeah. So big data. So that was just some allusion to, to So this is a, a 5 meg uh, hard disk uh, from uh, several years ago. So 5 meg now, I don't know, is an email attachment, right? And so uh, it, it, things have changed a, a lot over the years. Also, this is a sequencer from one company uh, that's available now. So where you basically drop your DNA and it goes uh, into uh, the Oxford Nanopore. So it's, it reads DNA directly in, into, uh, into your, your laptop. It's a USB key into your laptop. 
So things that we've set up uh, for you. So we've loaded all the data files on, on AWS this week. Uh, we've brought up a Linux instance of an, uh, with lots of software for NGS analysis. Uh, we then uh, cloned these things and made uh, separate in instances that everybody will be uh, using in this class. And we've simplified security to sort of basically uh, all have the same login and, and, and password. Um, and this is because we're going to be using data that's freely available. There's no, there's no controlled access uh, permissions that are required. But the, the ways things are set up this week on Amazon is not necessarily the way you'd want to have it set up for your own instance. And so getting some familiarity with making things sure things are secure and, and so forth will be uh, very important. So uh, as Michelle mentioned, everything's on the wiki and all the, the updates of everything is on the wiki, so and all the changes. And actually, the actual instructions on how to get on Amazon is, is also on the wiki. And so it's probably best to follow those instructions. They're more they're the most up-to-date. And so this is from uh, this workshop. And basically, um, this is uh, screenshots from uh, Macintosh. And so and I'll have some things for the Windows. So I'll, I'll declare my Apple bias up front, and so I'm sorry for the PCs amongst you. And uh, so one of the tools that we're going to be using is, is, uh, is the terminal. And so one of the things you should do is, is put the, add the terminal to your to your uh, to your bar. And so the terminal is available from the utilities. Uh, so if you go to the apps directory and you have the terminal app, and then once you run it, then you should save it. To your uh, to your uh, to your uh, application bar because you'll you'll be uh, saving there. And if you start the, the terminal application and you do uh, ls or whichever Unix command you like, uh, uh, that, that's what it would look like. So just how many of you here, and don't be ashamed or sh afraid of sharing. I'm sort of relatively new to Unix. Okay, it's good about half the class. So that's so. So the Macintosh and uh, is really a front end to is, is actually a Unix box. So with with lots of graphical user interface and up front, but in the back end is basically the Berkeley operating system. And so it's it's a it's a classic sort of Unix box. And so what the terminal application does, it gives you access to this uh, space. And this is going to be also the interface that we're going to use to access Amazon uh, Cloud. And so, um, so this is actually from the wiki, and it gives you instructions, which I'm going to ask you to look at from the wiki, not necessarily from my page. But from the wiki, there's detailed instructions on how to do things. And so what we're doing here is we're copying this file, um, the cwny.pen, to, uh, to your machine. So you're, doing it, you're downloading it from the, wiki, from, the, from the wiki. And on the Mac, you do a control plus, and then you get to save file, link ads, or something like that. There's a control, I think on the control plus also on, on the PC. Sorry? Yeah, so yeah, um, we can all do it together, yeah. And so maybe the, our, our so now it's up, see we have some red stickers coming up. That's so, so we're gonna go to get your stuff on the wiki, and according to the flavor of your machine. Yes, there's two instruction sets. Follow the Macintosh Linux instructions, or follow the PC instructions? Yeah, so then how many people, So, so uh, the goal in the next five minutes is to get ourselves, yourself, onto Amazon Cloud. Yep. Okay? And so please use your stickers, but the instructions are on the wiki, so we'll follow through the wiki. Yep. And I see that Yes. Uh, 
แต่ไม่ใช่เหมือนมันถูกออกครับไม่ใช่แบบมันถูกออกแล้วใช่ So you could on your on your machine uh, you can download it to the desktop. It's probably not the best idea, but maybe you create a folder where you put all the stuff from your workshop. Maybe day one if you want to be super you know, organic and so separate things. But at least maybe make a CW folder on your directory or on your home uh, or off your desktop so that it doesn't mess up with all the other files. And that's you'll know where to go find those files. Do you use your red stickers when you get into when you're stuck? Somewhere, you yes. Get to a point that it doesn't quite work. So if you look at this file, this uh, .pm file, pem file, it's just garbled. I mean, basically, it's not very user friendly. It's all text, though. But basically, this is like a key that allows you to log in. So the computer, Amazon looks for this key to, to allow you to come in. To, to the, uh, because what happens is once you're on Amazon, as you know, how many of you have shopped on Amazon? Shopping. 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 Online shopping here. Online shopping on Amazon, yes. So, so one of the things that this account logging into will require is a credit card. We're not going to ask you for your credit card. But my credit card is there. And so, and it's this, make sure that not everybody in the world can log into this instance of the workshop. You need this, this key, basically, to log in. So I'm telling you the key. Uh, and the key is only viewable by the people in this room right now, so it's not everybody can go crazy. And then this is the account, of course, that the grants that are received from Amazon went to as well. So we're spending, we're not spending money on it, don't worry. But it is backed by your credit card. As you know, every Amazon account is backed by credit card. And so this is, we need some security and some, uh, so don't share this with everybody. This is a key we generated for to access these images. To this image. Yes. 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 That's correct. Yes. So some. So if you follow this tutorial, some of the things you have to do. Once you've downloaded this file, is that you have to change the permissions on the file. And there are several ways of doing this in Unix. You guys that use Unix now. A quick way is to do this command. So chmod 600 is the file name. And where the 600 comes from is by adding 4 plus 2. You do read, write. Execute, so you're doing six for the owner, zero for the group, and zero for the world. So just so you know, everybody's name badge has a two-digit number behind you, and oh, yeah. you need yeah. both digits for your. This is this is the number of your Amazon instance. Okay, I've had it. Be careful because I've had it before, where two people have been on the same one and they're overwriting each other's files. Oh, God, so. Very clearly again, you need two digits. These are your two digits. Okay.
Okay, so is it yeah. Okay. Okay. So does anybody have a number that's larger than thirty five? We have one. Okay. So you should not yeah, we'll we'll give you the number. Mark, 
Okay, anybody else? Does anybody have a number larger than 35? No, your number on your card. Oh, sorry, different question. So if you're done, please leave it over.